The gentleman to my right, some of you might have seen him last night at uh, the club. Most of us were. Um, he goes by the name of François Kivokian. Uh, grew up in France, lived in New York now for the, I would say, 37 years. And yeah, he's been there pretty much from almost from the start of a New York dance music scene. But um, yeah, didn't spend much time resting on his laurels at all. So please give him a warm welcome. How are you doing, everyone? Thank you. So you said 37 years in New York City. Pretty much. Um, what brought you here? Uh, I, I was not very satisfied with the, the scene where I was. I was in the uh, eastern part of France the last few years. I was there um, in uh, Strasbourg, right at the border of France and Germany. And it was a pretty international town, lots of people from all over Switzerland, Netherlands, Germany, France, all that, and like sort of one of those hubs, you know. And I figured if that wasn't good, then it was really not the place for me. Uh, and being, I was a musician back in those days, and being a drummer, I, I just didn't want to keep getting like everything second fiddle sort of, you know getting little bits and pieces when bands were passing through and doing concerts, and I really wanted to go where the action was, where the stuff was being made and created. And uh, in 1975, I was really crazy about Herbie Hancock and Miles Davis and uh, a lot of jazz and a lot of this sort of fusion and funk kind of music and this sort of electronic jazz that was coming out and some of the more interesting rock things like Jeff Beck and Santana and, you know, all that was really happening in the United States or some in San Francisco, most of it in New York. And uh, I decided that uh, if I wanted to really fulfill this sort of idea that I had that I was going to be playing in a band, I'd better go and find it at the source rather than keep getting uh, secondhand, you know, uh, I mean, you know, there was a very healthy scene, I guess, in Germany with the kraut rock and all that, but I, I wasn't really into that whole, you know, I wasn't speaking German, so it was difficult for me to hook up with these kinds of people. So I, I knew English, and it was really easy for me to just arrive in New York and start doing what I could do to uh, to get on with it, you know. And, yeah, what kind of city did you find when you arrived here? Um... City was about to go bankrupt um, because I guess they had a fight with the federal government or something, and it was just on the aftermath of uh, Richard Nixon resigning and the Vietnam War finishing and all that. It was, you know, a lot of very momentous events, but at the same time, I think New York has always had a very special kind of energy, a drive. Uh, a lot of people that come here have this passion, this relentless desire to get ahead with what they do and achieve things and create. And, uh, you know, it's always been like that. And New York in those days was pretty incredible. It still is, but in a different way. They cleaned it up. Back in those, you know, years, it was much more sort of like raw, <laughs> real not Disney-fied. So raw in what ways? Well, if you went to the wrong places, you could get mugged because you really had no business being there. And if you didn't know that, well, now you did. <laughs> How often did you get mugged when you I, arrived? I didn't get mugged. I didn't go to the wrong places. Or if I did, I went with friends. <laughs> or I knew people from the neighborhood. But, I mean, it's just to say it was a different scene. And... Um, it, but, you know, as a, as a city, I don't think that has changed all that much, 
to be truthful. M Manhattan probably has because it became very rich and sort of a concentration of wealth that is sort of pushed to the outer parts, all the, uh, the freaks, the weirdos, the bohemians, and the ones that don't have work. Like in Berlin, you know, where in Berlin you have like thousands of people who don't work, who don't do anything, and they go partying every night, and they're having a great time because it's very cheap to live in Berlin. Here, for what they pay in a month for a flat in Berlin, you could probably get a hotel for one night. <laughs> well, I'm exaggerating, but you get the point. So back in those days, maybe you had much more of that, that it was like, you know, a lot of people that didn't have to be, you know, I mean, it's always been a, a very difficult city to make it in. I mean, even, you know, for those of you who remember this old dude called uh, Frank Sinatra, he had the lyrics in the song, New York, New York, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. Um, he was just trying to say that it's a, a real struggle, and that's, I guess, something I found out from the moment I arrived, is that in New York City, people don't mess around, and if you can't, if you can't pay your rent, then they put you out in the street, because there's plenty of other people in the street that you're gonna join. <laughs> <laughs> so you just got to be uh, really doing your best to get on with, you know, at least keeping a roof over your head and food on the table. And once you do that, then a variety of interesting options make themselves available to you. It's like when you're in a game, you know, you get to level nine and you beat the first boss, then you can go to upgrades, level 10. And uh, New York is very much like that. And there may be cities that are much more welcoming, like say... Besides Berlin, I could think of Barcelona as being an especially nice place to spend time and chill and hang out, or some places in Italy, or, you know, there's tons of... But New York is hardcore, it's intense, it's like relentless, 24 hours a day, and those are things that made me love it. And from the moment I arrived here, I, I managed to meet people that were just... They were astounding people. They were people that were at the top of their fields and they were very, very welcoming. They, they took me in. They, um, they, they weren't really, they didn't have an attitude or anything. It was just like it's, it's a real city. In other words, I think the point of it was back in those days and still to some extent now, I think New York is a very real place. It's not about your agent, about who your PR connections are, or about your profile or maybe... Now there's could be that anywhere it's a little bit more of that, but I think back in those days it was just about okay, kid, what can you do? You know, this famous movie scenes where the impresario or producer is behind the desk with a big cigar and it's like, you know, okay, kid, show me what you can do, and then it puts you on Broadway the next morning or the next evening or whatever, and I think that's so, sort of sums up New York is that anybody could come in and really tried to do something and back in those days I've seen plenty of people do that like Madonna she started in a church sleeping in a church homeless nothing no you know just one leather jacket one outfit and she just would go and hang out at clubs and she hooked up with the right people and, 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 and you know it's like that's the only the kind of story that I've only seen happen in New York maybe it happened in other places but I haven't seen it And who was the first boss you had to beat when you arrived here? Uh, the boss called My Rent at the YMCA, you know, because that song, the YMCA, well, some of us, even if we don't like the song, we did stay at the YMCA. I'm one of them. <laughs> um, it was okay. I, I managed for a while. And you went, you looked in a newspaper for what drummers wanted or? Yeah, all that. I mean, you know, I kept going uh, and I, I found some people that my friends had recommended and they got me a job working at somebody's house doing like cleaning and, you know, like very glamorous, you know, from uh, wanting to be a jazz drummer to doing cleaning and doing the laundry. But at least I had a roof over my head and plenty of time to go practice and do whatever else and go to auditions and join bands. So that was good. And yeah, what was the first band you joined? Do you? I don't remember the name of it. But uh, I, you know, it was very difficult. It was uh, 
typically uh, for any audition where some somebody wanted drummer, I would face at least 75 to 100 people that I had to compete against. So I did get some jobs and I started, you know, doing a little bit on that circuit, but it was it was really rough and the gigs the bands were getting were not paying that much and it was so difficult. So it was, uh, yeah, very different scene of, from what it is today where I guess um, that syndrome of 75 to 100 people at auditions is probably uh, transferred to DJs now. <laughs> or to actors. That's how I would, would imagine it. And yeah, you mentioned DJs. That was kind of an opportunity for you then, right? As a drummer. Well, to uh, it's just that uh, I, I managed to uh, get uh, hired to play in clubs along with the DJ by a club owner that wanted to have uh, some extra entertainment besides, you know, the DJ just playing the records. So it gave me a quick look at what the job of DJing was. Uh, you know, I was just sitting there on the dance floor playing six hours straight along with what the DJ was playing. His name was Walter Gibbons, by the way. Um, and I got to understand really fast that It was a pretty easy thing to do. And instead of having to show up with like a whole van, truckload full of equipment, I could just show up with a little bag, with a few records, and get paid. And uh, like I say, <laughs> in New York, uh, I guess uh, back in those days, it was very important to try to uh, stay afloat. And that presented itself as a much better opportunity for me to... Uh, get a steady income and lots of gigs than the, the drumming thing, which was really too difficult. Um, so I, I just decided to do that instead. And how was your workflow with Walter Gibbons in the club? Well, he didn't like me at all because obviously there was a delay from my drums, which were in the middle of the floor to the to the DJ booth. So whenever I was playing along, Even if I was on time with the music, he would hear it delayed, and it was kind of mess up his mixing. Um, so he was not very happy about it. But, you know, he tried to, like, throw me and put all these drum solos on, and I kind of knew all of them, so I could go along. And <laughs> So it was more of a fight. Well, it, you know, just like any fight, I mean, if people are, like, sort of able to, like, stay on the level, then nobody wins. It's just like a draw. I didn't want to fight, but he was like sort of annoyed at it. And then he got to accept it, and we became real friends anyway. And just really quickly, who was Walter Gibbons for people who might not have heard of him? Uh, it's just one of those incredible early DJs from uh, New York City. He's the person who uh, did the first commercial 12-inch, uh, which was on South Soul Records, 10% by Double Exposure. He also remixed uh, countless classics uh, of those early disco years, like Hit and Run by Lolita Holloway and so on. Uh, as well as more recent ones like Set It Off by Strafe, which got sampled thousands of times. And um, yeah, I mean, he, he was definitely a big inspiration to me. He was, his motto was drums for days. And I guess as being a drummer myself, I could relate to that. And was he also the person who took you to a studio no. then? Not at all. He was just doing his thing. And right after I met him, he got into a heavy, heavy religion. And he decided to stop playing a lot of songs because they were all dirty or didn't have a good meaning in the lyrics. And uh, sort of went <laughs> complete take took a left turn with his career and he you know he was not interested in being involved in anything that was that had a bad message in the lyrics and uh, I was like well okay uh, but anyway I uh, being in the studio was just because I got hired years later uh, 78 by this record label called Prelude and they wanted me to uh, do a and R. And uh, also to be uh, sort of um, 
do remixes for them and, and you know they gave me my first chance to uh actually go in the studio what i what i had done before that is uh i had started doing some uh dub plates like edits teaching sort of myself to uh cut pieces of tape with a, a razor blade and editing block and making like little medleys and re-edits of stuff this is like 77 and uh you go to this place and get it pressed up when they made dub plates and um this was really helpful for me because uh as dj when i was playing those it was like powerful concentrated energy and uh i was doing quite a lot of those and they were you know doing pretty well for me and from there when i when I got uh, hired by the label, I already had a pretty good idea of what this whole studio thing was about. So it's a pretty easy fit for me to uh, start doing that. And yeah, w what was it about back then as opposed to maybe what it is now, especially with the term remix that you mentioned? Uh, I, I think nowadays when people talk about a remix, they're really talking about a reproduction which means you just keep a few elements of the original track and you completely twist them and change them around <coughs> until it's unrecognizable, pretty much. Uh, back in those days, I think it was really not about redoing everything because most of the times the tracks that were there were recorded by professional musicians and chances are that their stuff was usually a lot better than what you could do on your own or you'd have to hire m new musicians to redo what they did or you know did it really make sense once computers came into the picture it was obviously a very different thing because it allowed people to be very lazy and get away with <laughs> mediocre reproductions of things that just have enough of the flavor of the moment to catch people's ears but doesn't have lo the longevity or the emotional value that maybe those older you know things had But when you talk about remix today, usually people will go, oh, yeah, I'll take a little piece of the vocal, I'll take the bass line or a piece of melody and trash all the rest because obviously people are expecting me to redo the drums, redo the, you know, add my own percussion, give it a different tempo. And it's really a reproduction. You really, it's almost like you're sampling the original and doing your own track. Back in those days, I think a lot of what we were doing as remixers was taking the same track but giving it a different structure, different parts, completely changing it but keeping the original elements that made it good in the first place. So, big difference. And should we maybe listen to one of those tracks on Prelude? Uh, sure, I mean, I don't know what you have in mind. You want to pick out one of those D-Train ones or something? Yeah, should we go to D-Train yeah, right sure, away? Yeah, sure, sure. I, I just want to make sure people understand. All I did was I was in the studio. The recording was finished. The singing, the music, everything was done. All I had to do was mix it. That was my contribution to it, and the rest was done by other people. So do you remember the day you worked on D-Train? Keep on? Yeah. Pretty much. I mean, I can't tell you the exact date, but uh, I do, yeah. Even in like a career like yours, you still have memories of all the things you did? I'm sorry, what were you talking about? I'm <laughs> That's what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm putting you on here, sorry. Uh, oh, pun aside, I think that, um, you know, I, I remember quite a lot and... Um, Some of these were pretty memorable times. Uh, yeah, of course, I do remember. This record was mixed uh, at uh, the studio that belonged to Jerry Ragavoy, that uh, later, you know, the same building, it became Quad Studios. Um, I do remember that the engineer was so incompetent that I had to like kind of tell him to just go and take a break in the TV room or something and ended up doing it all by myself because the guy just didn't know what to do and you know we were getting a cheap studio and the 
the staff was not really competent. So I ended up having to kind of do it with the producer. Now, just making sure you know, you guys, um, this was not a remix. I was going in, we were Hubert Eves, who is the producer, and myself went in with the idea of making an album version and a 12 inch mix. You know, it was not a remix, it was just a mix. Like, you know, we're, they just finished a recording, we just gotta go in to do the proper album version, single, 12 inch, whatever. And, you know, that's what that was. Then, uh, you know, a week later or a few days later, I decided to, um, I had to go back in to, um, to do uh, the performance tape thing that they call the TV track, which is basically the same version. I didn't, I kind of ran out of time uh, when we were doing the main mix and, uh, you know, we need a performance tape so that the artist can go and do live gigs, which is the same exact mix, but without the lead vocal. And then uh, when that happened, uh, I decided to uh, run like some additional passes and stuff. So what you just heard before, this is what it became. I did this like in 10 minutes. Anyway, this was just an afterthought. I was in the studio back for 10 minutes. I had some extra time. And I decided to uh, to run a little piece, uh, you know, like when DJs do like special versions for themselves, specials. And uh, I didn't think anything much of it, but I realized that when I was playing it, people were going absolutely nuts for it. So uh, we decided to release it. The whole thing was three minutes, but it still worked wonders. Uh, you know, with those were the kind of things we did back in those days. But it wasn't called special version. It was called dub, right? The dub yeah. version. Yeah. So maybe can you uh, talk a little bit about that term, what it means to you? It's a dub is, of course, like a reggae term. Well, you know, it all has to do with Jamaican music. And uh, the idea of dub is that you really sort of reconstruct, deconstruct first and then reconstruct the track around very, very basic elements and use like lots of processing and lots of delay and, you know, things of that nature to, to make it very sort of otherworldly and completely not like the original was uh, when it comes to the arrangement and the aesthetic of it. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that, you know, something that we... Uh, started heavily incorporating into uh, our, at least some of us, um, really doing that quite a lot. And uh, in my uh, personal case, that was kind of becoming one of my trademarks, like a lot of records that I did in those days where um, incorporating, you know, dubby elements. And the reason for that is because the audiences seem to really thrive on on hearing those. Like, you know, at, at, at a lot of clubs, people would uh, hear the original version or the main 12-inch vocal and, you know, play that for a few weeks or, you know, and kind of get bored, you know, because it's so plain and the dub allowed people to really go completely different places and spice it up and make it, much more interesting in some ways and, and uh, give much more room for the DJs to experiment with that, going back and forth between the normal versions and the dubs and so on. It was like sort of a, like say this D-Train one I just played, is more like almost like a DJ tool where you can overlay it on top of another track and you could do this and then be very dramatic about it and set the mood in different ways and... You know, it was uh, something that slowly kind of became a standard sort of staple of uh, remixing. That you were able to find the dub version on the B-sides of a lot of those New York dance 12 inches, right? 
And um, yeah, but you, how long did you work with and for Prelude Records? Then? Uh, I quit. I I was uh, I started in July of 1978, and I worked with them until 1982. So three and a half years, something like that. And what made you quit? Uh, I wanted to start doing productions of my own, and they, you know, because I was working for them and I got very, very successful, I was highly in demand, and they kind of were at a bit of a quandary because I, I they were paying me a weekly salary and they demanded that I, I start being exclusive to them. Uh, with remixes, they still allowed me to do a thing here and there, but with production, they said, well, if we're going to let you produce things, even for Prelude, you have to be exclusive to us. And I was like, you know, I love my job and really appreciate, grateful for the fact that they, they let me, you know, get a head start when nobody else believed in me. Uh, unproven, you know sending me in the studio when they had no idea what I could do. Um, but I wasn't going to sign away my rights just because, uh, you know, I wanted to do productions. I could do productions for many more people than just them. So I was in talks with uh, Chris Blackwell, who's the owner of uh, Island Records, and uh, other people like that, like, you know, Sire, Seymour Stein. And I could see from all of them that they wanted me to go and produce for them. So uh, I decided not to uh, sign my rights away by becoming an exclusive producer for Prelude. And as soon as I decided that, the logical step after that was to quit Prelude and to start doing my own independent production company. And if you say you were paid on a weekly basis, that means no matter how many of these records were sold, you got the same Yeah, salary. I mean, that's what you do when you get a salary. Except that uh, in the case of D-Train, the producer was impressed enough with my work that he uh, personally decided to give me a royalty from the sales of the records. I mean, we're talking about records that sold, sold well in the millions. <coughs> so it was a lot of money for me at the time. Uh, we didn't see millions in sales reported, but at least hundreds of thousands easily. So, um, but most times Prelude was, you know, I was on salary. No matter how good or how bad the records were doing, they were paying me the same, but I was guaranteed money. I, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. That was something for me to accept. And how did it go for you after Prelude? Well, uh, as I was mentioning, I... Uh, spoke with them. Um, I, I really was digging a lot of what Island was doing. They had, you know, all the Grace Jones, Black Uhuru, Robert Palmer, U2, a lot of very, very cutting edge kind of music. Some of it that was sort of fusing new wave and dance and reggae and all kinds of stuff that was truly unique. So, uh, They were one of the people that I really wanted to work with. And um, I had some meetings with them, and right away they, they sent me to London to uh, to work on some uh, some productions. Uh, you know, it's like one thing led to another. I, I kind of, you know, the year before I quit Prelude, I had enough of a track record As far as besides the work that I was doing day and night for Prelude, I found enough time to mix other records on the side, like the Dinosaur L, Go Bang, or Yazoo Situation. And it turned out to be that 81 was a peak year for me. I had the most number one uh, 12 inch remixes in the whole Billboard charts. So obviously, that means I was very much in demand with all these other you know, companies that wanted to get the guy that was getting all those number one uh, hit records in the charts. And because of that, as soon as I decided to quit Prelude, I got hired by all these labels, a lot of them in the UK, but some in the US as well. And uh, there was no shortage of work. I didn't even have to think about it. It, it was more, how many can I take? <laughs> And how did you kind of manage your uh, time? With that, were you still DJing? Uh, oh, you mean time? as far as sleep? Yeah, and food. <laughs> well, and you slept when uh, you could. 
I was really, uh, I was still DJing, but not for long. After that, I sort of decided that I had to make a choice, and I decided to uh, devote my time fully to the studio. And the reason for that is because back in those days, there was no traveling for DJs. It was a home, homebound kind of scene. So in New York, if you're a DJ, you're playing in New York clubs. I can't be a DJ in New York club if I'm spending three months in England, Australia, and Germany. So I decided it was better that I just stop that part of my activity and focus on production and mixing. And you, should we play something of the island things? That uh, you if you'd like, sure. You yeah. play the Jawabble thing since you said you had it. So this is a, a recording I did with um, Jawabble and uh, on this particular one uh, The Edge, Dave Evans from U2 is also playing guitar and uh, Arthur Russell wrote the lyrics for it. So there. Yeah, it goes on and on before the, the singing happens. It's one of those real extended. Anyway. So the singing, you said the ly lyrics were written by a guy named Arthur Russell. Yes. And Arthur Russell was also the person behind the Dinosaur L thing. Yes. Right? Yeah, so we became very good friends and, you know, I, I really loved his... Uh, sort of very quirky and abstract sort of sense of things. So I figured I should ask him to do something for this. And, um, yeah, he was... Did you work on more stuff with him? or No, that was really it. I mean, I, I did, you know, the remixes for his Dinosaur Ale project, but um, this is what I asked him to do. That, that was it, just write lyrics for me. And um, what were some of the other people you used to work with? On this on project or in yeah. general? On this project, we had uh, Holger Zuke and Jackie Lipzeit from Cannes, uh, from the group Cannes. Uh, I had so Dave Evans, The Edge, uh, from U2 on this. Then a keyboard player was named Ali Marland. Um, I had some of the people from the island... Uh, crew because they had sort of an in-house sort of little band like um, I think not on this song but maybe on another song I had people like Dick Cuthell and Rico playing horns and also uh, some of them in-house percussion players and on some other songs I had people from Public Image playing like the drummer from Public Image on one of the songs and different guitar players and it was all you know basically the people that Joe Wobble knew and uh, some of his mates from London as well as some of the people that he wanted to work with or in my case I really loved the guitar player from U2 so I said I, w I wanted Dave Evans to play and they managed to make it happen because back in those days obviously U2 was not a big super popular group they were just a great band but you know it was very approachable and Holger and Yaki How did you talk to them? Because you mentioned those crowd rock uh, guys in Germany and as you didn't... They were truly, you know, amazing people. I mean, they were like so, so unique and weird and strange. And that was kind of the perfect ingredient for the EP, what I was trying to do. So we, you know... But you didn't have to talk German to them. No, they yeah. speak English, no problem. And um, yeah, you from there on you found your way also in the, if I may so may say so, kind of pop market, right? Like, or in you working with more and more bands. And I, you know, I was just being hired by anybody to do stuff, and it, it just turns out to be that a lot of the big artists were finding out about what I was doing, and uh, you know, I, I, I. I It's difficult to say, like, sometimes how something happens, but one thing leads to another. Sometimes, like, some very weird coincidences. Someone hears something that you did completely unrelated and decides to hire you, and from that, like, say, 
uh, I did this remix for Bohannon, Let's Start the Dance, which had been remixed several times already. It was a difficult job because obviously I didn't want to do the same things other people had already done. And uh, it turns out that Kraftwerk really liked that Bohannon remix I did, and they hired me to do stuff for them. And from working with Kraftwerk quite a lot, um, Depeche Mode heard what I was doing for Kraftwerk, and they were like, oh, we got to get this guy. And then I started working with Depeche Mode and so on. It's really, you know, pretty much the same in life. I think one thing just leads to another. The more things you have out there and the more opportunities you get to really connect. And every time you get that chance, you know, just don't blow it. And you can really go places from that. I think that's the lesson to be uh, derived from this is that... Uh, it's good to be open-minded and uh, very proactive and make connections. It's just, uh, I think that's the story of what happened there. I, I wasn't particularly looking for anything, but these people, they were actively looking for a new talent to uh, collaborate or work on, on their music, and that's how it came about. So you just went where the calls came from? Yeah, I didn't have the luxury of really deciding uh, you know, I mean, I, I turned down a lot of work that I didn't like. But um, in general, I was just, you know, uh, as long as they played me what they wanted me to work on and I was able to sort of get a general idea of what it was going to be like, uh, I'd do it. I mean, you know, there were times where you have to understand back in those days, a lot of rock bands, they were really against remixers and uh, remixing had a very bad profile uh, certain people kind of made it, you know, a big sticking point as far as rock acts that they did not want to be remixed or have someone touch their music because it was destroying the artistic integrity. Uh, say, for example, I remember this... Um, the band from Manchester? Yeah, the Smiths. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, to me, it was just like another mix. They sent the tape contract label paid it was like book the studio let's go and do it 12 hours done finished uh you know it turns out to be that uh everybody seemed to have loved the the mix we did of this charming man except Ye for a, a, years later it turns out that i heard that the band was really annoyed at it But then again, I think Morrissey made a whole career of being annoyed at things and depressed and just in a bad mood in general. So, so I guess it, it must have fit the general vibe of what, <laughs> what was going on. But, uh, but do it, you think they made this Hang the DJ song because of you? I have no idea. And honestly, I really don't care because what they do is not on my radar. It's not on my cultural periscope. I, I, I'll be very happy... To, to claim right here that uh, I don't have any kind of like affinity with a lot of this indie rock scene. I'm into reggae, I'm into dub, I'm into like heavy funk music, I'm into lots of things, but the whole garage band, alt rock, indie scene is not my thing. It's You don't even, like the whining? Even though... Once in a while, there'll be something like Oasis or some other bands that come out that are absolutely stunning, you know, Stone Roses, whatever. I mean, lots of incredible stuff came out of the UK. Not even to talk about the person over there who's got a Joy Division T-shirt on. But um, I, uh, I, I think that in general, for me, I was not really into that whole, you know... I mean, I worked with a lot of UK bands that... I very much respected, like The Cure, where they kept asking me to do things. I did multiple mixes for The Cure. I did mixes for U2. I did mixes for a lot of, you know, people that I really get on with. But occasionally, some bands were just like, they had this attitude, like, oh, mixing is bad. Nothing good will ever come of it. And the way we see it is the only way it should be. And, you know, it's not for me to say whether that was right or wrong, but just for you guys to know that there may have been a time when doing these things was not so safe. There were like good chances that you're going to go in the studio and do something 
and you thought it'd be terrific and you spent all this money doing it. And then the label guy would come back and say, nah, the band hated it. It was like the worst thing ever done to their music and they couldn't live with the idea of this being released. And <laughs> But you still got paid. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. That's not the idea. Uh, the, the issue is not about getting paid. The issue is, uh, although nowadays, for those of you who may be interested in doing things like that, uh, I'm hearing that more and more situations, labels are doing what they call spec deals, where they send you the parts, they send you the stuff for the mix, or you have remix competitions. They let you do your work and do whatever you do, And then to decide if they like it. If they like it, they pay you. If they don't like it, you don't get a cent. So it's a lot more of a cutthroat situation here because you could be investing a lot of time and energy into a project and not see one penny for it. But in our case, when somebody was coming to hire us and say, look, we need you to do this, it was like, okay, well, this is what it's going to cost. Approve the budget, have the you know an advance forwarded and then we take care of going in and doing it so there was never any question about getting paid it was more a question about the release and uh, you know I think those were new times and a lot of people just didn't know what how to handle the dance market I mean I, I think even though the UK has far surpassed the United States uh, by the late 80s, early 90s, it, it really started coming into its own. And uh, whereas in the US, pop music, you know, the radio and MTV and everybody dropped dance and house and techno, in the UK it exploded and became gigantic. Uh, so obviously, you know, they really got the point. But back in those days when I was getting a lot of calls, especially from UK labels, It was always very iffy as to whether the stuff was going to get released or not. It was a good chance it might not. And do you remember when Mute called you for Depeche Mode? Well, actually, uh, Depeche Mode wanted me to work with them a number of times before that I couldn't do because I was already busy with other things. Like they wanted me to do Behind the Wheel and all these. And I kept not being available. It was, I don't know why. It was really weird. Through the mid-80s, I kept getting calls from Depeche Mode and not being able to work for them because, I mean, at least a couple of times, where I was really regretting it, but there was nothing I could do. I was already committed to, you know, working on some other big projects. So we finally had a big meeting. Um, in 1986, I guess. Or 80, no, I'm sorry, 88. Uh, I met with the band. The times before it was just through the label and they would just call like the usual, can you do this? Yes, blah, blah, blah. No, sorry, I can't do it. But that time I went to meet the band in person and we hung out and spent time. And uh, yeah, we, we decided that I'm going to come in with them and help them mix... Uh, first song from their new album and then if that worked out I was going to do the whole album for them uh, so that's how it happened and what was that first song? Uh, Personal Jesus yeah so that had to be uh, something we did in uh, June 1988 uh, in 89 I'm sorry Because uh, it was exactly when the Tiananmen Square events were happening on TV <laughs> in China. June 89, we did Personal Jesus, and uh, obviously that completely like took uh, the whole planet by storm, and they were very, very happy with the results. So we, we decided to go in and mix the whole album. Yep. And the album was called Violator. Yes. Right? And do you maybe have any special versions of those recordings? Well, I could play them for you, but then I'd have to kill you. No, you don't have to. We edit it out afterwards, so... Uh, I, I don't have anything special of the Pesh Mode with me, no. I mean, you know, we worked really hard on some of these, and uh, the final thing was the final thing. There was so much work involved. Like, Personal Jesus, I think I took a good 
10 days to mix that song, maybe more. 11 days of intense work in the studio. And, uh, you know, by the time there was like the final mixes, I mean, we did like four or five different versions, that, but they were all released. So that's what I have. And why did you spend so much time on that one mixing? Was it difficult or were you like, was it your perfectionist approach? Uh, I guess the band wanted certain things. We were, it's not really a remix again. It's a situation where I'm working with the artist, doing the, the, the real album version as well as the, the single. And then we do 12 inches. And, you know, uh, sometimes we'd stop in the middle of mixing and say, no, no, no. Uh, Dave's got to redo. Well, in this case, we didn't redo any singing, but uh, there may have been a couple of synthesizer parts Martin wanted fixed, or you know, uh, we we are going like, oh yeah, this is not really working like this. We got to change that. So then we s switched to recording mode where we start doing more. Oh, okay, yeah, that's better. That works. Then I had all kinds of ideas on effects that I wanted to add to the track where I recorded some of my own vocals doing like weird vocal effects like you know sort of oh, kind of sound or like percussive vocal things that I added as layers and uh, you know that all t took time because back in those days you had like hardware samplers and you know all this analog technology and all operating all of it was pretty time consuming and it was a big production. I mean, obviously the band was very big already. They just had done this uh, 101 and becoming massive. Um, they had one thing that's interesting about Depeche Mode, which I think would be worth mentioning to you guys, is they own all their all of their own music. From what I understand, they fund the recordings themselves. In other words, instead of going to a label to ask for money to record, Depeche Mode decided they're going to use the money they make from touring or whatever record sales and reinvest that to support the next recording. And that way, they own the music. Why is that important? Well, you're not at the mercy of somebody else. Like, say, in the case of Depeche Mode, their catalog was turned over to EMI Records. EMI Records is going bankrupt, was in receivership right now. I think Depeche Mode still own their own catalog, even though it's licensed long term to EMI. Obviously, no matter what happens on the business side, if you still own your own copyrights and you're a big art artist like that, it kind of makes it easier to keep managing your things. But um, anyway, I digress. No, oh, that's kind of interesting because i think some people to this day still haven't understood what publishing actually is for instance well that's a different issue but uh related but in the case of the pesh mode we just spent that amount of time because it was the new single from the new album and they wanted it to be perfect a lot of that time was done uh getting the right balances for the vocal for the single for the album mix we we just uh, wanted to have something that sounded great on any system, whether it was big or tiny or radio or whatever. We did a lot of testing in cars, in people's stereos, and take the mix out of the studio, go somewhere else and listen to it and decide, well, no, not that. Oh, this needs changing and tweaking, and I, I think it really paid off. I mean, there was no, you know... I remember some of the last days in that mix. We, I couldn't even go back to the hotel. I just slept on the control room floor or on the chair and just kept going at it until it was done. Yeah. And yeah, speaking of until it was done, Malcolm Cecil told us a few days ago that the job of a producer is delivery if you work with a band or musicians. So would you agree? agree on that if you work with a band like Depeche Mode you are the one who has to make sure it, things get done well that sort of depends on the band I mean uh, some people are more organized than others but yes in general that's pretty much it I mean obviously you're the point person um, I, I think it's like that for any project whether you're working on a, a TV series and you need to deliver X amount of episodes and 
such an amount of time, whether you're working for a gaming studio and you need to d deliver that amount of code and that many levels to your game. And, you know, there always has to be someone who kind of oversees the whole thing and makes sure it gets done and approves the artistic direction of it. And, you know, that for music, that was the job I had. I mean, I was the creator of the mix. Some of it could be very simple, like just myself in the studio doing it on my own. Other times I had entire teams of people that I was directing between the musicians, the assistant engineer, the engineer, the, you know, the, the band's uh, staff, because some of the bands have staff that come and so on, and I had to make sure everything was running according to a schedule and determine what needed to be done. Of course, you have to manage all that. And um, from there on, like working with Depeche Mode, you told us um, earlier on that because you were so heavily involved into all these mixing things that you stopped your DJ career. When did you pick it up again? Uh, well, it's interesting that you picked that particular quote because uh, right around the time I finished mixing Violator is when I also decided that I was missing DJing too much and that I, I just couldn't do without it. And even though I had started a uh, recording studio commercial operation, we had like a whole team of people and technicians and engineers and all that uh, and invested a ton of money into building multiple studios in New York. And that was also a business of its own, which I had people running for me, a manager and, you know, operations manager kind of thing and all that. Um, every time I heard new records, uh, like, you know, that year, 89, I can remember, uh, LFO making a particularly strong impression on me, that sub-bass kind of sound. And uh, some of the, the releases by bands like D-Light or Sounds of Blackness, and it's just too strong. And that music was really calling me. So I, 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 I decided to start again as a hobby since I had so much on my, on my plate between the, the work I was getting in the studio plus having to manage and deal with the studio, including continuous expansion. Studio ended up being a three-room commercial operation, and we had clients in there ranging from CNC Music Factory, Todd Terry, Madonna, Whitney Houston, all those people at the same time, and lots of hip-hop bands as well, and, you know, it, it was quite intense. But I, I kind of wanted to rekindle reconnect with the clubbing thing because I felt that as far as my mixing and all, I needed to still be in touch with that and what better way to do it than to actually play a few records and I was just missing it really. So I kind of started doing it by just uh, playing for free for people at parties and stuff. And a few months later I was in Japan doing my first overseas gig. <laughs> How did that come about then? They were uh, people found out I was DJing again, and as soon as that happened, I got tons of calls. And the market has changed because um, in the early 90s, um, there were a lot of traveling DJs already, people being invited to play here, there, and everywhere, and it had become a very international market. So those people were constantly looking for talent that they could book, and I got calls pretty much... The UK, Japan, Italy were the first markets that really wanted me. And that didn't feel strange to you because you mentioned earlier you come from a time where like the clubs had their resident DJs and you stayed at one club to play for your uh, kind of crowd there. You know, um, I, I was traveling a lot for production. It didn't really seem especially weird that I would be asked to go play at big clubs, you know, because I was representing a certain New York sound or a thing, and they wanted that. So I, I didn't find it strange. And how would you describe that sound for us? Uh, well, I, I think for a lot of people, it's just based on the records I worked on. And, 
some of it was obviously root, rooted in uh, disco, maybe for the early mixes I did, and then uh, branched out into uh, some of that sort of fusion electronic. Uh, we're all talking pre-house here, okay, but like sort of electronic records like, you know, the Yazoo or records like that. And the D train was was sort of an interesting thing because it was sort of a proto house, uh, you know, sort of very funky, very soulful, but different from disco because it didn't have the lush strings and all the, the syrupy arrangements that a lot of the disco had. It was much tougher and grittier and street like. So some of it was like that. I was working on all kinds of projects. I, I don't know if it was that easy to qualify or define what I was doing because I was trying to be very flexible. I worked on a lot of reggae back in those years. I worked with uh, Black Uhuru, Jimmy Cliff, Bunny Whaler, lots of different bands like that as well. And, you know, doing dub and proper like dub mixing and so on. So... I was just trying to, uh, you know, do whatever I could to help all the acts that were brought to me uh, do a proper, you know, version of what they expected. I mean, sometimes, as I mentioned, it was a 12-inch remix of Club, and other times it was album versions or singles or, you know, depending. I was certainly flexible in, enough to be able to do it. Yeah, I was also kind of aiming at the, your uh, involvement with the with a club called Paradise Garage and its DJ Larry Levan, you know? Well, I, I only played there as a guest. Uh, that was really Larry Levan's club, and he was the only one who ever played there regularly. The few of us who got asked to, to play was when Larry was out of town or sick or whatever, so... Uh, I only got asked to play at the garage uh, a few times, uh, like maybe eight or ten times or something. And uh, I was just there to fit in his shoes and f play for his crowd. So I, I did what I could to uh, to keep the party going for Larry's crowd, which I knew very well because I spent a lot of time there. And I guess the same way David Mancuso would ask me to cover for him at the loft when he was taking off. Uh, and T. Scott would ask me to play at Better Days when he was too busy or taking off. So I guess you could say in those years, which I'm talking about, 80, 81, 82, before I stopped DJing, um, I was the replacement guy, the go-to replacement guy when you needed to take off. Because I didn't really have a big residency of my own. And the reason for that is because I kept being in the studio so much, I really didn't feel I had time. Um, so, yeah, the garage was just an absol absolutely amazing venue, private membership club, which means that you cannot get in unless you're a member, which means that there's hundreds of people outside who tried to get in but can't. Well, they don't come back after a while. There were not hundreds of people outside. But uh, it thrived on the fact that it was underground, private, no liquor, no alcohol. It might strike you as strange that you have some of the best clubs going on where people are actually not intoxicated while they go there. But, well... <laughs> They brought their own, okay? Whatever they wanted to do, they did it on their own, and it was nobody's business. But I would say that there's, um, you know, a big difference with what I see some people's comments today. Like I'm reading some message boards where people are just comparing their clubbing experience, and they're saying, well, I can't remember one time I went to a club and I wasn't drunk. So... I guess in their mind, there's an associative culture going on where drinking and clubbing go together. Uh, the Paradise Garage was not about that. It was about music, celebration of music, a very deep, spiritual, heartfelt, and very intense and powerful experience. Um, I guess you... Uh, 
may have heard about it or you may not, but there really isn't a club like that today in existence at this moment. There are big clubs. There are great DJs. But to me, what's missing is that community. Really, if uh, I may, you know, say what I think was really significant about it, it would be that community grew around the club and it was a really astounding, absolutely incredible community of people and they're the ones that made the club so magical. And uh, for whatever reason today, and I'm not really going to try to uh, figure out why, communities such as that one do not exist today, private, where it's just people who are members and the general public is not allowed, you know. And um, I, I guess those were different times. It's hard to say now today with Facebook and social media and people hyper-connected and hypercritical and, you know, I'm not even sure it would be possible. Although I do have a fantasy of uh, a club nowadays where you actually would make, force people to leave any electronic device in a locker in the front of the club so that once they go inside, just like when you go to the opera or you go to something very special, you just focus on that and not be distracted constantly by other things. But, you know, that's just a personal on the, theory. On the moment instead of the memory? Uh, I, you know, I think these kind of shifts and uh, patterns of how people behave collectively are things that are bigger than all of us. And it's really hard for anyone to uh, even want to change them. But what you can do, however, is if you can afford it, just as the Paradise Garage did, because they had money in the beginning. They had some wealthy investors who decided to put money as a seed money to see what happened with it, with no strings attached, and let them do their thing and give them time to build and evolve. The same way today, I'm sure a club could be made where it's private, and uh, they've decided that you're not allowed to use electronic devices inside the club. No camera, no shooting, no recording. No texting, no, you know, posting updates on Facebook and videos and all that, which is all good. And it's fair enough people want to do that. But I think in the process of doing that, it sort of takes them away from being totally immersed, letting themselves loose into the music. So it makes for a different experience. And... Uh, I, I'm not sure that would be good or not, but I think hopefully at some point someone will think that maybe it's worth trying out. And was it something you approached with your body and soul uh, parties? No, we didn't think anything. We just... See, in the mid-90s in New York, competition was really intense for the big weekend nights. Like you had the Sound Factory and the Tunnel and the Sound Factory Bar and all these clubs and rivalries. I mean, you know, not to say anything of like all the feuds between Junior Vasquez and Danny Teneglia and this one and that one. And all these people sort of biting each other and fighting for the same crowds and this and that. And I think for me, back in those years, I was just looking for a place where we could do our thing without people telling us what to do and... We, we decided to not, I, I mean, I, I didn't want to be involved in anything that was on the weekend nights, like Friday night and Saturday night, which are big revenue nights for the clubs. And they, um, there's a lot of pressure. You have to play very commercial, keep the crowds going. And, you know, I, I wanted something where I could relax and, and feel very much at home and not have somebody looking over my shoulder and telling me what to do and, so uh, I met this, uh, this English promoter who was uh, trying to do a Sunday party, which uh, in 1996 was unheard of in New York. No one, no one had Sunday parties. And uh, we found a club downtown that was willing to uh, rent us the space for very cheap. I mean, the owner of the club was like, 
these guys are crazy. They're coming to do a party on Sunday. Like morning, we, when we started, it was a Sunday morning. We basically wanted to be in after hours for the other night. Or at least that's how, what was thought about when the, the party started. So the club guy was like, the owner was like, these guys are insane. I mean, how are you going to get people to come? And uh, we were like, look, don't worry. We just pay you your rental fee. Shut up. Just take care of what you do because we are going to take care of what we do, which is bringing people in, music, programming, whatever, atmosphere, decorations. We decided to make sure from the beginning that, and the same way I was talking about Depeche Mode owning their own recordings, from the beginning, from the very first time we set out, we made it very clear with the club that we didn't want any interference. We were basically renting their premises. So they are not allowed to tell us, no, you should play like this. You shouldn't let this person in. You shouldn't do this. You should do that. You know what? We wanted nothing. We just wanted to be left alone at peace as far as having a small group of people come and have a really mellow kind of anything goes party where if I don't want to mix and I don't want to beat mix because the songs I want to play are not mixable, I could do it and not have 20 people go, oh my God, he's not a DJ, he doesn't know how to beat mix. Uh, you know, we just wanted to share great music that was in our hearts with our friends and not have anyone tell us how to do it. And the point I'm trying to illustrate here is that whether it was about the Paradise Garage, whether it was the Pesh Mode, whether it was about Body and Soul, which obviously we just played the headliner uh, gig this weekend, this last Sunday for the Southport Weekender for a few thousand people. And we're still going 16 or 17 years on. Uh, whether it was all these examples, it's always control of your own destiny that's important. And uh, time and time again, don't expect business people who are better are, at, you know, number crunching and keeping the books and to have the creative vision that you're feeling inside you, things that drew you to do this, the things that pushed you to stay up, you know, sleepless nights and countless hours because it's your passion and when you're trying to express that and share it with people, time and time again, you will find that those who just invest the money side to take care of business administration, while it's good and they have their place and you really need to make sure that they're there to help you and keep it all together for you, they cannot interfere with your creative vision and they cannot put themselves in the midst of you trying to realize that dream and time and time again, all the situations and people that I've seen who are successful are those who managed very, very clearly to draw the line and define boundaries as to what the business and administration people are allowed to do and the creative and general freedom that they have otherwise to do as they see fit to develop their project and make it come to fruition. So in the case of Body and Soul, the first week we had 30 people or 40. And uh, I had at least three major name DJs come to the booth and tell me exactly why it wasn't going to work and that I better change, that I shouldn't have my friends come and play with me and we play as a team, that I should play this kind of music and not that. And who's going to want to listen to this and at these hours? And everybody was criticizing everything. It was great. Uh, and I took none of their advice. Uh, we just kept on doing what we did. The second week, we had 55 people. The third week, we had 75. Six months later, we had a room with 1,000 people. And suddenly, everybody was just like going berserk about this little party we had, which we never had any plan. All the only plan we had was just we wanted to do our own thing and be comfortable and share the music we love with our friends. And that was it. You know, I'm sorry. There was no grand design about it. And who are the other persons? So in the that team? was uh, 
Danny Crivet and Joe Closell. Uh, I I decided at the beginning of Body and Soul that um, I didn't want to play by myself. I wanted to play as a team and invite friends, people that I really trusted to play together, which means we're basically playing one record each or we're playing at the same time, like one is doing this, the other is doing that, and we're just sort of like fiddling with the music and working, you know, the system somehow. Um, and uh, it was a lot of fun and still is a lot of fun. And uh, the point about this is uh, that was kind of like the way I felt. I mean, I was certainly inspired by uh, David Mancuso from The Loft who um, used to have these uh, things where during the Loft parties he would do what he would call one-on-one -on -one because at the loft there's no mixer, you just play a record, you let it end, and then you play the next record. The crowd claps and shows a lot of appreciation, and then you put the next record on because Dave Mancuso doesn't like mixers, like those things here, because they degrade the sound quality. And being a real audiophile and not wanting to have anything in the way of having the music reproduced in the best possible way, he felt that no mixer was a lot better. And he also felt that beat mixing was very restrictive. So being that beat mixing only restricts you to play songs that are in the same tempo, at the loft you could hear songs of any tempo because there was no idea that the song that's coming next has to be automatically beat mixed to the one before, which really, if you think about it, limits your choices. So because of that, David Mancuso was able to... Uh, invite people like his friends and just say okay i'll just play the record play the next one and then he would play the next one after that and then his friend would play the next one they would have a, a musical conversations playing records off of each other and that that was really inspiring and um i um i was uh i started doing that with larry levan a little bit we went on a tour in uh, 1992 in Japan, and uh, we, we started playing like that together. And it was really, really a great deal of fun. So uh, when we got back to New York after the tour, we were actually planning on doing a night together on a Sunday night uh, at the Loft. And uh, unfortunately, Larry had some real bad health problems. and. Uh, couple of weeks later, went to the hospital and basically passed away a month after that. So there was really kind of not much I could do about it. Uh, it was so what I'm trying to say, it was an idea I had quite early on that I wanted to do something like that with people that I deeply trusted and felt strong musical affinity with. And um, I, I have to say both Joe Closell and Danny Crivet were people who are I, I held in so much esteem and I had so much admiration for for various reasons as DJs. So they were like the natural ones that I was going to ask to play with me and it just worked out. I, I, I don't know. I, there was no real plan except that we didn't want to have any interference in how we were going to express our musical vision and share it with people there. And... Um, I think the significant point about this particular situation would be that uh, it illustrates once again that uh, time and time again, in order for you to accomplish something that's really special, you need to be given enough room to develop it and have the patience to grow it and see it become something with people. And uh, the proof is that we're uh, still going with it. <laughs> And do you maybe want to play us something that you kind of uh, connect with the body and soul aesthetic? Well, uh, or a song that always makes you think of it. <laughs> it it's uh, funnily enough difficult to do because um, being so open-minded with our music policy means that we were just as likely to play some real biting techno like our Arabica, 
you know, Groove La Cord or Night of the Jaguar by DJ Rolando, as we would be to play like the deepest, most spiritual Afrobeat or uh, some really powerful, you know, strong house. And I mean, I, I, I think um, if anything, um, there is uh, one thing that um, we had uh, pretty much a year in advance of it being released at the party that were, was really a very special song for us. and. Uh, you know, you could say this has become one of our anthems. Um, okay, do we have audio here? Uh, we asked Jocelyn Brown to come and do a live PA of it. She said she didn't have the TV track because nobody ever requested that song. Uh, we were like, well, please make sure we got it from Masters at Work. And sort of... Uh, brought the house down. She was just astounding. This is uh, one of the staple Body and Soul tracks that we played from the beginning of the party in 96. So it's New York and Soul, right? Yes. It's, it's, it's all right, I feel it. And um, yeah, before we open it up to uh, have some questions from the audience, you also do Deep Space uh, on Monday nights which is kind of the other other side of what you try to approach as a DJ, right? It's very, you mentioned um, earlier on, cutting edge. Well, uh, Deep Space is a party I started in 2003 as dub. Something that had to do with the aesthetic of dub and trying to feature any kind of dubby approach to music, um, such as, you know, obviously the original Jamaican reggae, but not necessarily uh, keeping at that and trying to feature music that had mixes that really were in that spirit, as well as taking normal, regular songs and being able to process them and dub them out live just like I'm doing in the studio but maybe in a more simplified form but very highly effective using a lot of different processing techniques to transform a song that's pretty regular into something that can be quite spectacularly different but not have it done in the studio or beforehand actually doing it in front of people and uh, so that was the original intent, and it was, again, a very open music policy. I still, uh, I do remember playing Led Zeppelin the first party and have a whole bunch of people deciding that they're never coming back. And that was fine with me, because I think, in a way, that was a litmus test. You know, there are a lot of people, whether they realize it or not, nowadays, even though we have all this technology and all these things available to us, for whatever reason, all these choices, <laughs> all these options seem to restrict a lot of us to uh, adopting much more conservative views on what they like or what they listen to or what they identify with. And uh, Deep Space has always been about trying to unify all kinds of music through this common theme of having a dub aesthetic and sensibility and finding the dubbing spirit in uh, whatever it is that I could be playing, whether it's a vintage Euroid track from 1975 in King Tubby or whether it's uh, an Olivia Newton-John track, you know. <laughs> uh, I, I kind of like the idea of not being bound by like, too much of the conventional wisdom that, well, people are one-trick ponies and they just do one thing and that's all they do. So in that spirit, besides setting sort of a general vibe of what I was doing with Deep Space, I also decided to invite a lot of different guests. Some people would be uh, 
you know, Detroit techno people like Juan Atkins or Derek May or Carl Craig. Some people would be uh, people from the disco world like Dimitri from Paris or, you know, all kinds of DJs. I wasn't trying to limit myself to one thing. I invited Brazilian drum and bass DJs. I invited Indian Bangra DJs. I, you know, try to all bring it in to help people feel that rather than looking at our differences, which should celebrate what it is that we have in common and, you know, looking for an open-minded kind of crowd. And over the years of us doing that, we've been very lucky to have found such a crowd. Significant development of that was, of course, that around 2006, uh, south, 2007, this new sound came out of the UK that didn't really have a name in the beginning, but soon got to be called dubstep. And uh, what was really significant about dubstep, at least from my perspective, is that as soon as I started hearing some of it, I was really up on that digital mystics and all these early, you know, kind of records. I started playing them and I could tell right away that it was driving people mad, that they were they were just not liking it. That they were really reacting very violently against it. Like uh, I remember the first time I had Mala come. My light man quit <laughs> during the gig. He said, I'm not, I'm not going to play for this. I, I can't deal with it. Sorry. And I had many of the people that were coming to Deep Space go, look, if this is the kind of shit you're going to play, I'm not coming back. This is like, you know. And I was like, you know, in my heart, I feel that music is so strong, so powerful. It's like bass as a religion. How can we go wrong? And it's like an extension of all the good things I like about dub, exactly what the party is trying to express. So, of course, for Deep Space, dubstep was a natural fit. And because so many people hated it, we were one of the only people in New York that wanted to book dubstep DJs. So by 2008, 2009, suddenly... I could, I could book, the, uh, you know, Mala, I can book Joy Orbison, I can book Marion Hobbs, or anybody pretty much I wanted because nobody else is asking for them. And uh, before you know it, little by little, the word got around that Deep Space also features sometimes a lot of dubstep. And uh, we managed to really connect with those fans in that market and sort of help us, you know, gain a lot of, a new audience, so to speak. Um, the same people that were hating dubstep five years ago are now coming back to me and telling me how great it is. But, you know, uh, what's the moral of the story with that? Well, again, stick to what you believe in in your heart and don't give up because sometimes um, being a bit early or being trying to stay on the cutting edge will automatically mean that you can get slagged by people around you because they're not looking for that edge. They're looking for the comfort zone, for what they're familiar with, what feels good now, not tomorrow. It all depends on what you want to be. But I would just always encourage anyone to follow that intuition, follow that which is in you and tells you what's really great and what you should be doing. That could be that you want to do a retro disco night where you just play mid-70s disco edits. All the same. But whatever it is you believe in, I think the most important thing is, at least from my perspective, that you should listen to that and really try to coherently make it come to fruition and, again, have the patience to see it come. In the case of us with Deep Space and Dubstep, I think... It's a classic story, but come today, you know, I'm able to book Scuba, I'm able to book all these people who sometimes play much bigger venues because we, we all made friends. And they understand that when they come to Deep Space, they have a comfortable, you know, place to play and in an audience, and they'll feel great. So um, it, it's really been a, a blessing for me. Uh, we obviously uh, now in our 10th year as well. So all very long running events, which is also 
somewhat remarkable in a market that is very fickle and where there's a lot of change and a lot of you know stuff that uh, starts for a few months and just dies down and all. so you know I just encourage anyone to uh, stick to what you really really believe in because it doesn't always come easy and sometimes it's very frustrating but the payoff is definitely worth having the patience and the d determination to uh, see it through. And which Olivia Newton-John song would that be? Uh, Xanadu soundtrack, Magic. I don't know it. Do you have it? Sure. Sorry, I get goosebumps every time I hear this song. <laughs> yeah, speaking of dreams. Um, so... Questions from the audience, please. One, two. The microphone is coming to you. Hi, how are you? How do you go? Uh, what's your advice on resting the ear and the brain when you go onto an 11 day session of mixing a song? How do you refresh your ideas so you listen again with new thoughts? Uh, oh. First of all, there are two different things. Um, from working with a lot of professional engineers and other producers, <clears throat> I, I was lucky enough to realize early on that um, those who blast the music in the studio usually don't turn out very good mixes and that all the really, really good engineers and mixers that are respected were all working on very tiny little speakers to do their balancing, especially the vocal balance, but in general. When you work at a very, very low level, I'm talking about really low, like it, it's counterintuitive, but it's a lot easier to figure out if something's missing from your balance. Like on a radio speaker or whatever, a very small, because if it's missing, you won't hear it at all. If it's on a big, gigantic $100,000 speaker system, you'll hear it. It's there. It might not be. And when you're blasting anyway, everything, your ear sort of has this compression where it'll just bring everything sort of equalize to the same level, so you won't perceive that it's wrong and not quite loud enough or too loud. So yeah, the, the secret for me is uh, to work on very small speaker systems. I mean, obviously, that's not something you can do all the time, but if you keep you know, referring back to those tiny speakers for a lot of your work, you can work much longer hours and not get ear fatigue. The other thing to uh, obviously do, which seems very obvious, is uh, to take breaks and take the music outside. Listen to it in the kitchen, listen to it in your car, listen to it wherever you can, on headphones, on the little eye, you know, on your phone or whatever, you know. And I think, uh, you know, coupled to that, I find that whenever I do a decent mix, uh, you really need to locate yourself you you need to give yourself a target so like pick three records mm -hmm. that you think are really great sounding records that you're very impressed with and keep comparing what you do against those records and uh it should become very obvious very quickly what it is that you're missing or if you're off target a little bit and just try to aim for something that's coherent enough that's it thanks Hello. Uh, going back to the beginning of the 80s, it really feels like New York has a distinct and specific sound. Um, can you maybe uh, talk us a little bit about your maybe three biggest records that are representative of this? Can I talk about what? Three biggest? Your, the three biggest records that are representative of the New York sound, that like the beginning of the 80s kind of? Uh, well, has. I, I think... Um, One of the acts that we played earlier, D Train, you know, uh, to me, what was really significant about D Train is that it had this sort of electronic funk approach about it, which was 
what many of the people who made house music later in Chicago acknowledged as one of their influence. Um, so yeah, You're the One for Me by D-Train could definitely define the sound of New York. Very soulful, but tough, gritty, driving. Uh, then uh, I guess the uh, Dinosaur L, Go Bang, is also pretty unique because it, it's completely in a zone of its own. But I don't really... I mean, you could argue that maybe there were bands like Rip Rig and Panic and other people in the UK that were sort of doing that. But I think Dinosaur L is also pretty unique. Uh, you know, I guess uh, even though of it's, it might not be something that I've worked on, a record that I always associated with the early 80s New York kind of sound would be Planet Rock by Africa Bambara and the Soul Sonic Force because when that came, there was nothing else that could touch that record. It was just like, it's like when you're playing cards and you put the Joker down, it's like everybody else, you know, folds because uh, that record was so strong. There, there was nothing that year that could top what Planet Rock did. So... Those three records right there to me would be a, a quick summary of like three songs that define the early 80s New York sound. Thank you. Hey, I was wondering if you could speak about um, your approach to the 12-inch mixes that you were doing in the studio and what you were thinking about would be happening on the dance floor. If, and even if that was a consideration when making them? Well, uh, I could write a book about this. I'm not sure I could summarize it in a few phrases, but uh, I guess in general, there were, you know, different approaches, okay? Uh, throughout the course of a career, obviously things do change. Um, early on, I guess you could say uh, it was more about keeping the original music and just doing arrangement business about figuring out a way to take the parts that I liked and feature them much more prominently in the record, which could involve changing the intro, extending instrumental sections, doing breakdowns, making the vocals appear at completely different times where they were and this and that, but later on it became much more sophisticated because I had the ability to sample or place everything anywhere I wanted, change the tempos, even change the key, uh, whatever. I mean, it's basically nowadays is a totally open blank slate from, you know, the original tracks they give you. You could pretty much do anything you want. You could change a minor key into a major key probably, even if you wanted to and so on. So uh, I guess... Uh, what it boils down to is just identifying the target audience that you want to please. I mean, you know, obviously, if you want to make a dubstep record, uh, you're kind of going to know what you set your tempo at because since you have that flexibility, you need to decide everything. You need to decide the tempo, you need to decide the key, you need to decide, you know, so on and so forth. And a lot of that will be dictated by what you decide you want to target your mix at. You, you can uh, just do a standard house mix. You can make a down tempo, you know, R&B, hip hop kind of tempo mix or, you know, balearic. It all really is a, a, a function of what you're trying to do. Um, you know, say if I was doing techno record, I might want to strip everything down to like a couple of weird noises and set something that builds very in a very hypnotic kind of manner. Other mixes, it might be more vocal oriented. Obviously, you still want to have sort of a song structure there. But you could also do a mix where it's just a few vocal snippets here and there and just illustrate other things. And it, it's endless. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I it's not like I don't want to answer your question, but we could be talking about this for a month, and I think everybody has other things to do. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. 
More questions? No? Then, ah, one in the corner. Please pass on. I've, I've basically been trying to come... Hi, Francois. I've been trying to come up with a... Um, a, a question that would be a good excuse for you to play Go Bang, but um, you kind of just answered it in the last one, so I was just wondering if you could play Go Bang. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what would be great, seeing as that, you know, as DJs, your mix is always the definitive mix that everyone draws for when they play. Like, I just want to maybe, in regard to the question that you just answered just now, whether we could listen to Go Bang and, and maybe you could talk us through the process of what you're punching in and out or how you approached doing a mix like that while we play it. Or maybe just play the song. <laughs> Is that all right? Just playing now. Great. I could only tell you that this was very painful. <laughs> the, the way the production was done, he basically had 24 tracks of 16 melodies and 12 songs all together on one tape. There, was, there were so many different instruments playing Everything all at the same time. Well, I mean, you could hear in the original version, it's just like so chaotic. And I had a lot of trouble with this one uh, because I, I needed to make things come into focus. And uh, even though it sounds very smooth and seamless, the pieces you hear and the progression of it come from different sections of the song, I had to pick, well, this part here, that other part there, and sort of make them fit. The tempo kept changing a little bit and whatever. I mean, it was a real challenge. I actually did a mix and I hated it. And I decided to go back in and do it again, <laughs> which was quite rare in those days. But um, it was a very challenging situation because basically you have like all these musicians improvising and adding all these layers of overdubs and things that seem completely unrelated. And it was really uh, a thing where I had to kind of compose the song from those elements, like the different vocals and, uh, it, you know, it, it was not a smooth like say, for example, when we, we played the D train earlier, those were very structured, they were well laid out. Everything came in exactly when it was supposed to be. And there were very few choices to be made. Obviously, there was a lot of balancing effects and drops, and I still ended up doing lots of stuff. But this here was incredibly challenging because besides doing all the other stuff I did on D train, I also had to first make sense of musically all these completely different flavors it's like if you have a ragtime band and a calypso band and you know a trombone and tuba section and all these things all on the same record and it's like why did this guy do all this it was just like i it was very difficult for me to make heads of tails of it i mean obviously i eventually did and i loved it but it it required a lot more involvement on my side because Literally, you could take any single track on this tape and make a whole song out of it that'd be completely different from the other tracks. They, none of, some of them may not even have been playing in the same key. It was just like mass confusion, this record in particular. So uh, um, sadly, I think an example of something like this would be very rare today because... Uh, I don't know of anyone working in that kind of way in the studio today. <laughs> so you'll be safe, don't worry. <laughs> Your last chance to ask a question. Another one in the, and another one in the middle. Is it red or green? Should be green. Hi, uh, I was listening all the lecture, and uh, the main idea that I got is like uh, follow your your impulse, your dream, your wishes, and uh, I was thinking uh, like, you know, I came from Buenos Aires, Argentina is a country that 
it doesn't have the, the structure than the States or Europe for uh, release your stuff, for make your music. And uh, I was like listening your experience to move from France to to States. And I was thinking about all that thing. And uh, I would like to to hear you say something about that. You know, it's like the first lecture that we had, it was Richie Hutton. And he, he told something similar. He came from Canada to Detroit. Uh, Ten minute car ride. OK. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> sorry? Ten minutes by car. Ah, okay. Yeah, but, uh, okay, but uh, I don't know. It's like coming from Brooklyn to Manhattan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand, but, uh, well, you, you had a long trip. Yes. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so I, I, do, I, I was thinking about the whole thing and... I don't know. I, I don't know if it's a question, but... Uh. <laughs> so you're asking if you should move? Do you Maybe, want me to I recommend a specific airline budget package? Or? No, 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 no. Uh, I mean, look... Maybe it's just... Where a, do you want to go? No, no. I was thinking maybe it's just... If it's follow your dreams or is an economic problem or you know what? Let me let me just use your question okay. as a jumping point since uh, this is for everyone's benefit. Um, I'd like to expand on this idea of follow your intuition. There are times when I play where uh, I've made sort of a pact with myself. I'm going to play whatever comes to my mind. So I'm playing a song. Whatever it is that comes to me, no matter how crazy, different, out of context it may be, I made this pact with myself that sometimes I should be able to play a DJ set. Where I'll put whatever I, I just thought about on. So. I started doing this quite a number of years ago, maybe seven, eight years ago. And sometimes it has some pretty crazy results. And I think sometimes people don't like it at all because they more and more appear to be conditioned to a continuous, steady, seamless, flattened out delivery of the same kind of music for hours on end. And when I play like that, uh, you know, I could play anything because it just comes to mind. But the point is, by doing that, I noticed that even if it sometimes had poor or unexpected results, the good part about it is that it's encouraged me and it's made me become more in tune and listening to that sort of inner voice that suggests to me things that I should play. Uh, I think there's some people in the room like this guy over there, Matthew Johnson, that see me do that when I was playing in Tokyo. It's sort of like stream of consciousness playing. You're playing something and bang, you just go like, because that thing inside you told you to do it. And by doing that, years and years, I've encouraged it, I've developed it, I've allowed it to become more and more vocal and speak to me more, so to, so to, you know, point is that whatever it is that your dream is, you should do whatever you can to encourage it and to give it ground to grow on and to take root and to blossom. And uh, I'm not sure what that way is going to be for you, but I think you should try to be in touch with yourself enough that you know what it is that you want to do. And then it'll become very obvious where you need to go and who you need to do it with. It might be sometimes by accident. But I think the process, the important part, is about searching and seeking and being open to things that will be unexpected and being fearless enough to take that chance and make the move. So I hope this can answer your question. Thanks. And there was one more in the back, right? Yeah, I was originally going to ask about go, the, the Go Bang process, but you went through that already. Um, 
But um, going back to something actually a lot less insane, um, your happy song or dance at it, um, which was based on the old Walter Gibbons routine. Um, what was the process like of just, you know, back in the days when you used to have to do tape edits? Um, what was that process like? Like, how did you actually physically do that? Well, I had never seen how it was done. Mm-hmm. So I took uh, a pair of scissors and I, I just like to start rubbing the tape against the head of the tape machine and figuring out which head is it because there's three heads. Okay, mm, maybe this one. Okay, let me cut here. Oh, no, not that one. So then I figured out which head on the tape deck was where the playback was. Then I just took the pieces of tape and, and just took a pair of scissors and scotch tape because I didn't know they were like editing blocks and stuff. I, it was all self-taught. So I that one I did like that. I kind of did it by trial and error. And then I was like, oh, okay, I see, okay. Let, cut it, and I, I didn't even cut it at an angle. I cut it, like, straight, because I didn't know. And uh, that's how I did it. I, I, you know, I hadn't seen anyone else do it. I knew it was being done. I, I more or less kind of had an idea that you needed tape and scotch tape, and that's it. So, you know, the important thing is not so much the way you do it. I think it's, again having a creative direction or something I wanted to do. And in this particular case, uh, I had heard Walter Gibbons do these very specific drum sequences with, with the intro of that song, and it was easy enough to recreate, and that's all I did. Well, that was my backup question. I really wanted to ask the other one, but you got jacked. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. No problem. Some more? No? Yeah. Just wait for the microphone. Um, hello. Um, so, I, I, you, you sort of mentioned like two things that in my mind sort of don't really go together, but at the same time I think they do, which is working on big pop records or stuff like the Pesh Mode and then doing a club night or a club on a Sunday morning playing the, the exact same music that you wanted to play. So, and is, is there, was the whole pop thing like ever a concern or a worry or like having to make something that's like that labels will like or that that like you know something that people will like and a label will receive it and be like okay this is good we can do something with this and then it goes number one or whatever and like how how do you manage that is like how did you manage that whole that's like that pop threshold or whatever like that that thing that's always like um it's a team effort, you know. You, you're coming up in a situation where you have people who spend months in the recording studio agonizing over every bar of every track of how the guitar solo is going to go and the vocals and the layers and this and that. And a lot of them, they take a very long time and lots of money to produce these records. And, uh, you know... Um, you need to come to that game prepared with equivalent sort of talent. In other words, uh, on my end, whenever I did things like this, I had to hire top flight studios, top flight engineers, uh, top flight musicians if I needed to redo anything. Uh, We're talking about a time when things uh, would cost a lot of money. I mean... um, I did a remix for Mick Jagger where he kept wanting to change things, and I think it took two weeks in the studio. Each day in the studio cost at least two, two, three thousand dollars plus the engineer, which is at least a thousand dollars a day. Plus, uh, we hired the Brecker Brothers, we hired Dave Sanborn, we hired like all these like world class musicians. The remix budget must have cost something like forty five thousand dollars. But Mick Jagger wanted it. Uh, you know, if he has the money to, to fund it, he could do whatever he wants. I mean, uh, for a lot of these acts, they have massive following. They don't, first of all, they don't want to disappoint their fans. And second of all, they want to make sure that it's right until they feel that it's the product that they want to come to market with. So if you want to play that kind of, you know, game, 
so to speak, it's not a game, but if you want to be in this kind of activity, you need to step and rise to the occasion by providing an equivalent level of service. In my case, when I was working on acts like that, I would hire a top flight engineer, or you know, mix engineer, and top flight studio, like I said, I mean, there's, those didn't come cheap. I mean, this was certainly thousands and thousands of day. And those people are highly skilled, and they are able to help me express my creative vision of what I think should happen and take me away from the technical details on what's happening and allow me to focus on the creative end of things. And really, in the end, you know, sometimes the artist would leave me to do whatever I wanted. Other times, they were so heavily involved and trying to look over my shoulder that I couldn't do anything, but I got paid anyway, you know. It's just like, you know, something you do. I mean, you know, if, um, you know, Justin Timberlake or Beyonce or somebody like that is going to call you tomorrow to work on them, you don't think you're going to do it? No, no, yeah, I, I'll do it. It's, for me, it's just complicated, like, to, uh, <laughs> to, know, to know, like... Okay, but here's the thing. Are you going to do it with your, your setup at home on your little computer or whatever, or you may have a studio and I may not know. But the difference is that the situations that I was describing to you, I was as a producer or as a mix producer going to professional facilities with people like sort of making a team. And I was just, you know, putting that team together to put the project, you know, into a situation where I could deliver a real high quality product. If Beyonce or somebody like that is going to call you today, do you know who to go to to do that? Or do you need to? Or do you feel confident enough that you can do it all at home on your computer? And you're going to get the same results I was getting? Well, no, no. I will definitely get people. And I know the people that I want. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> but it's. I think it's... My, my question is a little bit more like... like if you're... If, like wh- how do you realize that you're doing something like something like working on a mix or something and adding an element like a kick drum or whatever? How do you realize like what's the point? You're like okay, I'm I'm gonna stop this because the only reason I'm adding this kick drum is because I think somebody's gonna I'm, somebody's gonna want it here. I don't really want it here because uh, you know uh, it's a very open question in the sense that. Uh, it depends on who you're working with and depends on the context of what you're trying to deliver. In other words, uh, if you're hired to do uh, a tech house mix or something, or is it that you're hired to do an album version for the artist? What, what is your question about? The album version or a remix? Those are vastly different yeah, things. Yeah, I know, I know. It's, it's sort of... I, guess. I mean, you... It's a matter of context. In other words, you as the producer, you obviously have to know what the market wants and what the artist may want and what you want. You have to reconcile all these different things and figure out how to make it work. And uh, the reason I was talking about the intuition before on the other question is because in a way it relates to something which I think is very deep, uh, which is a lot of times you already have the solution in you, but... Getting it out of you is the hard part. <laughs> um, when you were talking about like some of your, re- your some of your mixes like went to number one and that kind of stuff, um, how would you have managed? Obviously, you played you played, had a club night and it was very underground and you guys were just playing whatever you wanted. How did you manage the integrity between yeah, being that a number was one? not at all at the same time? It wasn't the same time. Oh, not okay. at all. So fifteen years apart. Oh, okay, fair enough. So when you was getting those mixes that were going to number one i mean i was still playing in underground clubs but it was not my own night i was just guesting at other people's so when you were just saying when you was doing a mix that got to number one or got that kind of attention did you go into the studio with the idea to get a a mix that was gonna have that that commercial appeal or did you was it just a situation that it just happened i i'm sorry i never ever worked like that in other words there was a very definite audience that I was targeting my work for, which was like, say, maybe the garage and loft and kind of general New York dance crowd. Um, 
as long as those people were okay with it, then I was fine. But you see, the thing in those days, uh, the radio stations like uh, WBLS, and Frankie Crocker, they would keep going to all the clubs during the weekend. And like say, he would go to the garage and he would hear Larry play something really hot. It was on the radio six hours later on heavy rotation 10 times a day. Now, this doesn't happen anymore. But in those days, you could have something happening in the club that literally could be on the radio hours later, played for millions of people. And what I'm trying to say is there was this link between the underground, real raw kind of private clubs and all that, and the mass market. And then from that radio play, of course, there was an incredible demand and the labels had to rush release the stuff. And they would go on to sell millions sometimes, hundreds of thousands or millions. And uh, that influenced uh, the public's taste. It, it kind of swayed the general public to really like something. So, you know... Uh, Sounds like it's a good time. It's not like that now. For sure. Because of that, then the bigger pop acts and established artists were taking notice and going, well, for my record, I want to get the guy that did this. That, that's kind of how it worked. But doesn't it sort of still work like that a little bit? I mean, I've done, I've done some mixes myself and... Um, in terms of getting a mix, like you said, we in this time we have to. Sometimes you do it on spec. But sometimes people do mixes on spec, and if you're going to deliver a mix, then it has to have some some kind of appeal to a certain level of the market. And so you would be in well, from where I've come from, like right now, you would have a certain market in mind when you're when you're doing what you're doing, and it probably would be beyond just the underground at times. Uh, well. Yeah, I mean, uh, the thing is, if you really want to look at, you know, since you're asking me about something that happened in the early 80s, you're coming up against a uh, different element today, which is what I would call market fragmentation. Uh, in those days, you know, as a DJ, as a working DJ, would go to the record store. If there were 20 or 30 new records a week, that was a lot. Uh, records would stay in my playlist for months and many DJs would be playing the same records when many DJs play the same records and we play them for a long time that means that there are hit records being created because everybody's listening to the same thing and it creates popularity and I think the way this relates to the situation today is completely different because um there is such an incredible of m amount of new releases and new stuff coming out through the pipeline that as working DJs, we have we can easily listen to two or three hundred records a day and still not go anywhere near the amount that's being made. And uh, it's making us play records for much shorter periods of time. Like I think nowadays on the average, if I have a good song, maybe I'll play it for three weeks and then I move on to another song. But does that, you know, it, it relates back to the old question. Does the human brain, is the human brain really capable of following such an incredible breakneck, breakneck pace of, you know, uh, I personally always thought, even back in those years, that um, in order for things to stick to people, they have to hear it a certain amount of times to get familiar with the melody, to really absorb it, understanding, and deeply feel it. You don't necessarily like something the first time. But because of this fragmentation and the incredible amount of competition and everything, it's kind of given rise to uh, people making tracks that will be easy to access. They don't have maybe as much depth as the old ones did because the old ones took time to absorb and it required like weeks and weeks to get used to it and finally understand it. Like even like Go Bang, I could tell you, the first time I heard the thing, I was like, you want me to work on what? 
Like, it was such a mess. Like, you know, I did as a favor, but whatever. The point is, nowadays, because I have, people have seem to have collectively very short attention spans, and there's so much choice and things available, and there's so little time and slots available in your playlist to keep playing the same recurrent things. You don't give people a chance to absorb it and for them to become familiar with it. All these factors converge. And they make it a lot harder to cut through in the same way that I might have. So um, I'm trying to say this for everyone's benefit, but I think, you know, we're discussing things that happened 20 or 30 years ago. The situation was vastly different from what it is today. And even though I was very successful back then with the things I did at that time, I personally uh, harbor doubts as to whether I would be successful today in the same way, just because there would be so much more competition. And to be honest with you, and I'm not going to mince my words about it, the same way I was a drummer, and I kind of decided to shift gears and change directions and do a DJ thing, because it was so much easier for me to do. And when I went from my drummer auditions, being standing in line with 75 other people, when I went to the DJ audition, there was only three people. And of course, I beat them hands down because I was a musician and I, I, I knew how you know, music is supposed to mix and all that. And, uh, but if I was in that situation today, I wouldn't want to go into music. I would do like create video games. I would do uh, 3D mapping, modeling. I would do other things that are where there is less competition because that, you know, I can hire a thousand musicians to do things for me because they're all dying to get any opportunity to do work. But I think it's clear that in career wise, everyone needs to identify what it is that they're trying to accomplish. And in my case, even though it broke my heart not to be able to keep going as a drummer, because that's really what I was originally about. Um, I still found a way to like sort of channel all my energies towards other activities that were closely related to that. But it was just a matter of trying to go around the obstacle rather than keep trying to hit it, you know, headstrong. And, and I, I think I would have probably, I don't know, maybe I would have made it that way, but I don't think so. And I think if I was in this situation today, I doubt I would try to be a DJ producer because like, it's like, you know, I go down outside my apartment, the, the, the laundry guy is saying, hey, listen to my CD. And, the, and then the taxi driver say, hey, you know, I just made a new track. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> I mean, I, I respect that it's great that all this technology is giving us access to so much power and so many tools to do stuff. But what I'm trying to say is that at least some of you, even though you're all passionate about music, obviously, uh, at some stage you kind of have to reckon that you know the way something is going to happen for you is going to be by doing something that makes makes sense, makes you unique, in demand, and so on. Uh, if I was in that position today, I would design software, like you know. I don't want to, I don't really have time to get into the theory of why I think that, but it's a matter of layers. It's like the food chain kind of layers. Like used to be that music was made by musicians and that was like the final link in the food chain, but then DJs went above that and used music to create new raw material and make new stuff out of that. It used to be the final link in the food chain. Now, I don't think DJs are the final link in the food chain either. Now it's people who create the software that DJs use. So I, I think you need to realize that and keep moving up that food chain as it evolves. And I, you know, for anybody who's really looking to make a career in that, I think it's, it's very important to be mindful of that, not suggesting that you give up music at all. I'm just saying that people be honest with themselves and see what opportunities are really out there for them. I mean, if you have one chance in 10, it's better than one chance in 1,000. And at this stage of where I see music being nowadays, uh, you know, I, I think, um, and, and maybe slightly different for live bands because they, they can go touring and get their own audience and fan base on their own. 
But for DJing, I, I, I just, um, I see it as something that's incre incredibly difficult to achieve as far as differentiating yourself from all your competition and making, or remixing and all that, making a product that is that different and that much better than other people's. And the reason why that is difficult is because I think the consumers, the customers, are getting inundated with such an incredible endless flow of free stuff that it, it's difficult for anything to really impose itself on the market as it used to when there were like many hit records. So food for thought, I, things that maybe some of you might want to reflect on, but uh, even though this is Red Bull Music Academy and I'm very conscious that we should stick and limit ourselves to music, I personally would uh, recommend that uh, anyone who's really seriously thinking about this should find new and innovative ways to design software systems that thousands of people can use that include music and that deal with musical things but will allow their app to be sold on an you know apple you know app store or things like that and that to me is what i would do today if i was looking you know to get but still related to music but not the old way. Thank you. All questions answered? Good. Then, Mr. Francois Kevokian, thank you very much for being here. And please <laughs> clap your hands. <laughs>